former Arkansas governor, Republican Mike Huckabee, Sunday on C-SPAN's Road to the White House 2008. Governor Huckabee speaks on his career, his potential run for the presidency, and his new book, From Hope to Higher Ground, 12 Stops to Restoring America's Greatness. Governor Mike Huckabee, Sunday at 6.30 and 9.30 p.m. on C-SPAN's Road to the White House 2008. Road to the White House is also available as a C-SPAN podcast. Washington Journal continues. Linda Robinson of U.S. News. Some of the publications today have used this picture. This is the New York Daily News of the president. It says a tear rolls down the president's cheek as he awards the Medal of Honor. And there's a headline in, uh, in uh, the Financial Times. And they use a, also a picture of the president walking through the White House. But the headline is Bush Stands Alone with New Way Forward. And the picture you can see there uh, shows him walking out to the helicopter, but with his head down and all that. Is this, you think this is the right way to cover this thing right now? Well, I think after listening to the hearings up on Capitol Hill yesterday, I would say yes. I mean, except for the Republican um, leadership of the uh, House and Senate, you just heard lots of Republicans, not just Democrats, expressing deep skepticism um, over the Iraqi government's ability to deliver on their part of this, and frankly, I think deep disappointment that this plan being offered doesn't appear to do more to promise success. I want to show you just several pictures this morning. Again, this is on the front page of the Chicago Tribune, uh, and it's a picture of Condoleezza Rice, and you can see it. And it, it that's the only place I saw this particular expression on her face. Then you go here, and you see a picture that they're using from the Associated Press by Scott Applewhite. She's got her head bowed, and she's in front of the, the flags when they had the news conference yesterday. Right. And then here is a, a photograph of her on the front page of the Houston Chronicle. It's a different angle. Uh, I guess, you know, and there's a lot of other things where Barbara Boxer is taken to task in the New York Post for the way she treated her about not being married and not having a, a family to worry about over there. What, what, do you, what was her day like? Well, the hearings, and again, thanks to C-SPAN for broadcasting this because people who didn't see it live could see it again. Um, she was really taken to task, uh, Secretary Rice, I think, for not having more answers. She kept getting asked the same questions. What kind of guarantees uh, do you have that the Iraqis are going to deliver? What are the benchmarks? What's the timeline? Where's the accountability? Um, and so I think that that was reflective of the unanswered questions that if the administration wants uh, this plan to fly, they're going to have to deliver more answers. What are you most surprised about this week? Um, I guess, frankly, because we have been waiting for many weeks, over a month, for the, the plan, I guess, uh, frankly, I was um, surprised and thought it was a little thin. I mean, I feel like I've been a very objective reporter in all of this, but I, I have to say, um, there are a number of commitments that the Iraqis have made. They made back in the fall uh, to deliver on demilitarization, demobilization of the militias, passing an oil law, uh, providing up to, well, billions of dollars they have sitting in their own coffers from the oil revenues that they have not spent on their own reconstruction, um, a date for provincial elections, um, and the debathification revision. All of those things were laid out in an Iraqi timeline, and I wrote about this in November. It's actually mystifying to me that the U.S. officials yesterday testifying did not point to this timeline and give very specific dates. All of these things are supposed to happen by March. The oil law was supposed to have happened in December. So the failure of the Iraqi government to deliver to date is what's undergirding the disappointment that you're hearing now. What is the oil law? The oil law is a provision for sharing the revenues. Most critically, it's how the oil revenues, Iraq's main resource, are going to be shared among the regions and among the various ethnic groups which are at war there, the Kurdish, the Sunni, the Shia. So that is one of the essential political pieces of this. And you know, we've in the coverage, I'm afraid, there's been so much focused on the so-called surge, and I do think we should talk about the military numbers. Um, 
but many of the counterinsurgency experts, many people, they and, and Senator Levin, the chairman of the Senate Armed Services Committee, put out a statement saying, without a political solution, we're nowhere. Uh, so really, what the core piece of this is when the Iraqis are going to deliver on these five or six things that represent a political compromise around which that country is going to solidify. Without agreement on those political uh, issues, um, no number of troops, by many people's estimation, is going to put Humpty Dumpty back together. On the numbers of troops, the New York Times this morning is the only one that does this. Tom Shanker writes, a new strategy vindicates ex-military chief Shinseki. And he talks about the fact that General Shinseki, Shinseki lives in Washington and in Hawaii, but he's never said anything since this all has started. And he was the chief of staff in the Army who suggested, uh, or, is he, or is he chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, suggested that uh, we needed a lot more troops. Um, yes, that was very uh, early in the whole debate before, of course, um, uh, we went to war in Iraq, and that has come back, been brought back up many times. Uh, he gave a figure of several hundred thousand, but uh, there are, and he was relying on uh, metrics that the military used in Bosnia for the peace stabilization, peacekeeping mission there, which wasn't even a war. It was a much less demanding situation. And they used a ratio, which is more or less what the various counterinsurgency experts um, believe is needed. And the, the formula, and I'll be writing about this in next uh, Monday's uh, issue of U.S. News, but the formula is, is this. You need at least 20 troops per every 1,000 population. And by that formula in Iraq, where you have 25 million, you come up with a need for about 500,000 armed uh, army and police forces, security forces. Um, and in the case of Baghdad, which has a population of 6 million, you come up with about 120,000. And that's just, you know, you can, you can tinker with that. But basically, these experts say you need a minimum of that for that number of population. Because what you have to do, first and foremost, as the administration has recognized with this new plan, you must provide security to the average person so that they will support the government, so they will not be afraid of the insurgents and the people with the guns. General Pace yesterday explained very carefully that the Americans would not be working for the Iraqis under their command. But as he laid it out and talked about the structure, uh, he gave you the impression that the Iraqis were in control. They were going to be making the decisions. The Americans were just backing them up. Do you believe that? Uh, well, that is very much what the Iraqi government wants, Prime Minister uh, Nouri al-Maliki. Uh, in fact, their original plan was to have the Iraqis T taking control inside the city of Baghdad and have the U.S. playing more of a support role out in the perimeter. Now what they're doing is uh, they're going to try to put the Iraqi forces in the lead in each of these nine districts, but in each, nine, each of the nine districts there will be a U.S. battalion in there, um, supposedly living in there, working with them day to day, so a more intertwined um, approach. And they're also going to be more U.S. They're going to double or triple the number of U.S. advisors actually embedded in the Iraqi units. How many times have you been to Iraq? Um, five times. Uh, been there for month or two month long visits. Each How time. about Afghanistan? Uh, Afghanistan, I was there in March of uh, 03. Our guest, Linda I'm Robinson, sorry, is, a, is a native of Pittsburgh, and she has been at U.S. News since December of 1989. She is a graduate of Swarthmore College. And uh, she has a book out called Masters of Chaos. That was 2004, all about the U.S. Army Special Forces. Our call in this segment starts off from Bay City, Michigan, a George Bush supporter. Good morning. Good morning, Brian. <clears throat> Been a listener for over 23 years, a wife and I. I'm 84 years old, and I'd like to make a comment. I believe that uh, most people, when they read the newspaper and the media, all they ever do in the media and the newspaper is bash Bush, bash Republicans. I've, I've seen it over and over again. And a lot of people, that's the only place they get their news. And uh, it's a wonder that his rating is low. Because, uh, like Will Rogers said one day, he said that all we know is we're reading the paper. So that's so, my comment. So you, you blame the media for uh, President Bush's low popularity? Yes, sir. I do. Right, because that's, that's all they do is bash me. I've been around a little bit, different papers in different states, and uh, everyone I pick up, <clears throat> they just bash them. Republicans all look out. They go, they just follow the Democrats' uh, blog, you know, when they talk, and uh, they, they just hype it right up. 
Thank we have, okay, thank you. What do you think mm -hmm. of that? I mean, that's the criticism you hear from conservatives. Yes. Republicans. Mm -hmm. <coughs> well, and all I can say is I invite the gentleman to look at my stories. I think they've been very balanced. I've been over there quite a lot, been uh, embedded in the command as well as in the field. I've represented what their policy and approach has been, and I think it's just manifestly clear that what has been attempted has not um, worked, and I think that's more of an objective conclusion than um, a journalistic uh, distortion. In fact, the president himself has, has admitted that and that what they tried to do last summer in Baghdad, they did not have enough troops to secure, uh, secure it. The Iraqis did not come forward with enough of the funding for the economic piece. Um, so I, I think that, uh, you know, I would respectfully, although I certainly the gentleman's right to have his opinion, I don't think the media is uh, is at fault here and a wonderful institution of C-SPAN and I invite everybody today to listen to the Senate Armed Services uh, hearings for themselves. This is an unfiltered way of getting exactly the answers uh, to the questions that I think most Americans have. And that will be available to you this morning on C-SPAN 3 and we're sorry for a lot of areas of the country they don't have C-SPAN 3. It's on the digital tier in most of your systems. A lot of people who even have it don't realize they have it. So look around. Uh, we go to Chicago. You're on the air. Good morning. <clears throat> I'm looking at U.S. news and other media publications more in complicit, uh, complicity with the uh, administration. If you look at uh, the blogs and some of the information that's been flowing on the in Internet since the beginning of this, whereas it was stated that the goals of the administration was to go into Iraq, uh, create a chaotic situation, uh, spur on the sectarian violence, and then basically split Iran into several pieces, or excuse me, Iraq into several pieces, and progressively move into Iran and Syria. And that plan is fully uh, playing out. I mean, we talked about the axis of evil earlier. And if you look at <clears throat> the course of events, it has been just that case. Originally, we went in, we knocked out Saddam Hussein, we disrupted the government, we killed the infrastructure, uh, chaos ensued, then we sent our troops over, undermanned understaff, lack of equipment that was covered yesterday uh, by Oberman. Um, so our troops started, you know, taking hits. All of a sudden we made the case that, hey, you know, we, there was a big situation here. They hate us. Let's bring in more folks. Then we brought in the, the mercenaries. Uh, no one talks about that. Uh, I think the numbers are somewhere in excess of uh, 10 to um, 20,000 individuals that are private contractors, underarmed. Uh, they've been busted. <clears throat> setting off bombs. Uh, other troops have been busted setting off bombs, such as the Brits, and they had a, a, a breakout. Folks have been uh, exposed wearing Arab uniforms, uh, blowing up mosques, and then blaming it on others. And that goes into the context of spurring on the sectarian violence. All right, sir, I'll let you go. It sounds like, is that a, is he, mm -hmm. is, has he developed a conspiracy theory here, do you think? Um, well, <coughs> I would... I guess say so. But I, I think there are a couple of points perhaps worth noting um, in, in the context of the president's uh, speech. And not only did he address the Iraq situation, he did also take the chance to address Iran. And while many people had been expecting possibly a diplomatic initiative of some sort, that was what was called for in the Baker Hamilton Iraq study group. Um, and many people brought that up yesterday in the hearings. Uh, instead, he said he, it was a very strong demarche against uh, Iran's involvement in Iraq. And he said, we're going to take on the Iranian networks inside Iraq. And he said, we're sending a carrier strike group uh, to the region. So that is at least a symbolic. That is not obviously intended to strike at the insurgents in Iraq because a carrier strike, strike group is not uh, militarily useful in that situation. So you have to read that as some kind of move, a uh, signal against Iran. From page of today's Washington Post, Bush's Iraq plan meets skepticism on Capitol Hill, but it's this photograph taken by Logan Mock budding of Getty Images. Paratroops from the 82nd Airborne Division prepared to ship out from Fort Bragg, North Carolina for a year-long rotation in Afghanistan where U.S. and allied troops are battling a resilient Taliban insurgency. Plans to increase the active duty ranks of the US, United States military reflect concerns that repeated rotations have worn out troops and equipment. NATO and Afghan officials, meanwhile, said scores of insurgents were killed in fighting on Wednesday. Street, Marilyn, you're on the air. Yes, I, I, I watched some of it with Condoleezza Rice uh, yesterday. <clears throat> I got so disgusted with it, I turned it. They were so disrespectful to her. They screamed at her 
didn't give her a chance to answer anything when she said, wait a minute, she wanted to answer. They scre literally screamed at that woman. It was very disrespectful. Second thing, uh, General Pace did say that he wanted more troops. And third, most of what I'm uh, makes me mad, all these senators, we elect them to take care of our districts. Not one of them takes care of their own districts. They're always, a, they should not be over there in the war zone. We, we supply the people to take and do their security and all, like the camera people. They go over there, they get hurt, the people with them get killed. They're the ones that get the credit for, for getting, kill, getting wounded, but yet the military are getting killed. I just think that the senators have no right over there. They only see the bad things. They never see anything good going over there. And it's sad. They need to take care of their own district. We're paying them to take care of our state. Caller, let me ask you something. If they go over to Iraq and they never see anything good, whose fault is that? Well, I'm, uh, how do we know if they're seeing anything good? That they only report on the bad. They never see anything good. Like when the president went over there, when the uh, first time he went over, Hillary Clinton followed him. Now, that was right after he got elected. He went over to have to meet with the military. She went over and cut him up from day one. This is still a struggle. The Democrats are mad because he got in, and they're retaliating. And it's sad. I've seen a few Democrats like... Uh, Kucinich or whatever, he he was on there, and he was being honest, but he took it from both sides. I'm a diehard uh, a Republican, but he is one that I've seen that really seen it from both the Democrat and the Republican. And I'd like to see him run for president. I'm sorry, but I would. What about the Republicans that now don't like what's going on? What do you say about them? Uh, well, like Lieberman, he couldn't get in as Democrat, so what did he do? He ran on independent and got in. That's what the, the Republicans, it changed to Democrat, so they're moving to, to the other side. Thanks. People confused today as what they believe, you think? Um, well, I want to just, I guess, make a couple points, because I think that there are, there were certainly some strident uh, people in the in the hearing yesterday, but what I was struck by was the people who are just very, I think, deeply sad. Um, Senator George Voinovich of Ohio, he said, I bought into his dream, referring to President Bush's uh, plan to democratize Iraq. And, and Senator Bill Nelson, Senator Norm Coleman, Senator Lisa Murkowski, all Republicans expressing, I think, very great sorrow uh, that we were at the situation that we're at. And so I think that that, uh, at least it struck me a different way. This is subjective, of course. But there is one thing that was offered in um, President Bush's speech, which was a bipartisan working group. Senator Lieberman, which the caller um, mentioned, is, I think, going to be part of that. But it's a way, I think, of trying to get more dialogue going with the Hill Capitol Hill, of course, now uh, Democrats in charge of both chambers of Congress, and I think this was one of the things people were looking for in this speech, was what kind of uh, outreach was the president going to do uh, with Capitol Hill and with Congress in order to forge a common front here for what happens next in Iraq, because a, a, I think the qu clear path forward is if you get a split, a deepening split, Congress eventually is going to get to the point of using its one power, which is the power of the purse strings, to say, we're not in for this anymore. Now, we're far from that still. We don't even know if a resolution uh, is going to get passed or not, be brought up or get passed. But, but I think this is one of the big questions in terms of the um, broad federal government's posture right now. Is there going to be a movement towards some common building, common ground, or are we going to see some deepening um, splits here within the federal the uh, a testimony of Condoleezza Rice was put on a lot of front pages, but here is the way the New York Post covered it. It's war, dem, childless, condi, slur, and it's all about the fact that Barbara Boxer suggested that Condoleezza Rice doesn't know what it feels like because she's never been married and has no children. Right. <clears throat> That's what's upsetting some of the Republicans. It, it was, um, I think that the Senator Boxer was 
and as she later tried, I think, to revise her point a little bit when Secretary Rice was kind of taken aback by the way she made the point. But I think she was intending to say, you and I do not have children who are fighting over there, who, whose uh, blood is going to be shed. And she went on to read some excerpts of uh, news accounts um, where of people who had lost children there and the great hole that it has left in their, in their uh, lives. So that, that was uh, the point. But I think it came off as a little too personal. Um, and I, you're seeing some of the, the reaction to that. But I think the, the it's war part of that headline also refers to the fact that, first and foremost, this policy is aiming at putting more troops in when a lot of people interpreted last November's elections here in this country as a call for troops to come home. Rupert Murdoch's New York Post writes, Democratic Senator Barbara Boxer, an appalling scold from California, wasted no time yesterday in dragging the debate over Iraq about as low as it can go, attacking Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice for being a childless woman. Boxer was wholly in character for her party. New York's own two Democrats, Hillary Rodham Clinton and Chuck Schumer, were predictably opportunistic, but the Golden State lawmaker earned special attention for the tasteless jibe she aimed at Rice. Ashlyn Maryland, you're on the air. Go ahead, please. Uh, I think that's Ashlyn in Massachusetts. You're right, it is. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Linda. Good morning, Thank Brian. Uh, I want to change the subject a little bit. It's still about Iraq, but it's, it's something that's the uh, nuts and bolts of fighting a war. I'd like to know what the status is on, uh, as far as the IED protection of the, of the vehicles that these new troops are going to be riding in that go over there. My understanding is that these forces that, have, uh, that are going over there, that have gone over there, uh, the vehicles out of their motor pool are still the old, unprotected uh, Humvees and whatnot. So uh, when these guys get over there, they're going to be riding in death traps. The second thing I'd like to find out, I have seen nobody publish this, and I think it's a crime. Uh, nobody is reporting on the status of uh, the IED protection of the vehicles that, that our guys are over there running around in. You know, it, it, it came up and it was a news item for a while, then it disappeared, and we don't hear anything more about it. So uh, uh, the, uh, the last thing I'd say is that the enemy over there is not stupid. He uh, recognizes that he knows probably more than most Americans the status that, uh, uh, of the equipment that these guys are going to be bringing over there. And if they're going over there with the old vehicles, uh, they're going to be uh, working ground the clock burying these IEDs. Thanks, caller. Linda Robinson. Uh, it's a very good point, and um, I'd like to say I was last there in July, August, and what I saw was a mix of equipment. Um, you've got a lot of uh, the up-armored Humvees at this point out in the streets. Um, the ones that are not armored, they try not to use off the bases. Uh, you've got many of them equipped with jammers. That is one of the techniques they're using to foil the um, IED de detonation. You have buffaloes, which are these armored um, kind of trucks that have a long arm that go out and pick up, robotic arm that goes out to uh, pick up the IEDs when they find them. But it's very difficult. And there's an IED task force, uh, as I'm sure the caller knows, at the Pentagon. They've been working on this. Billions of dollars have been devoted to it. Uh, it's a very difficult tactic to defeat. Um, I was up in Kirkuk in one of the places I visited and, and in a, an old Humvee, the unit, it was actually a Special Forces unit, they had an old Humvee uh, and it was, had been there since the beginning of the uh, war in '03. So there is equipment that's old, a lot of equipment's been damaged, uh, you've got mounting costs in terms of that, repairing, replacing um, that. So I think it's still very much a valid concern. Uh, but a lot of people say, you know, it's the setting of the bomb is the end of a long chain of events, which includes the formation of a cell and a network. And so they're trying to go after uh, finding the inv individuals, which is easier in many respects than finding um, the actual uh, bomb once it's been uh, placed there. And of course, you go back to the original causes of the war, working on that end of it and trying to get a solution in that, um, from that end. On this Friday, January the 12th, the Christian Science Monitor puts this picture on the front page. The Commander's Prayer for a Corporal. 
President Bush bowed his head Thursday during a White House ceremony in honor of Medal of Honor winner Marine Corporal Jason Dunham, who was killed in Iraq when he jumped on a grenade to save comrades in arms. Atlanta, Georgia, you're on the air. Hey, how you doing? Are you there? Yes, sir. Go ahead, please. Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm prior military, and I, I, I got to see what Barbara Boxer had to say to Condoleezza Rice. First thing I'd like to say to that is, Barbara Boxer, you never served. You, I, I doubt you actually know anybody, really, that ever served, uh, like 90% of your Congress up there. That, that it's, it's ridiculous watching how they pick apart a war. You know, they're all generals as far as they're concerned, but yet none of them have any experience. Uh, next thing, if you want to see the war effort go better in the press, remove the press from Iraq and only let military correspondents that are assigned, you know, that are active duty military write the articles. Because from what you read in the newspapers, we're lucky that we haven't been shoved out of the country. Uh, by by the insurgents from I, Iraq and or Iran and uh, Syria, this is it, it's 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 very frustrating watching this. Uh, the next thing, you know, the amount of deaths, we're up to a little over three thousand soldiers. At that pace, to reach the number of deaths that we had in Vietnam, it will take fifty eight years. This, you know, let's put it in perspective. Uh, and when I say I was active military, I was active military for several years. Oh, and next. All these men and women there, they're all volunteers. They all volunteered. None of them were forced. Uh, they weren't drafted. I, I don't understand how the Senate comes up with what they do, how the House comes up with what they do. Uh, it's, this is very sad. They are rooting for our loss. That is all there is to it. There's no gray area at this point. They're, they want us to lose. Uh, and this is from our own people, and that is pathetic. Caller, what would you feel if you were against this war? Would you still think that only military I'm, correspondents ought to be reporting the war? I'm actually, I, actually, I am against this war. I, I didn't think it was a good idea at that time. Uh, but you know what? Once you're there, you're there. And you have to take care of business. And for the troops to be sniped at by the Congress is pathetic. To be sniped at by the by the press is terrible. And I, I just I can't comprehend how they think they're doing service to anybody by supporting Islamic fundamentalists. And that's exactly what they're doing in who's, the long run. Who's sniping at the troops? The Congress when when they're they're whining and they're bickering, that is sniping. Uh you know, it, you you might not like what's going on, but you know what? You keep your mouth shut sometimes, and you say, "Drive on, let's get this thing done." And what if is, what if it just goes on and on and on and never ends? Ah, well, you you have that possibility as long as you put political restrictions on your military as to what should be done. Uh, I guarantee you, you could take a ranger a bata uh, a battalion of rangers right now and run them through. And, and as long as the press wasn't around, your violence would cease in a lot of areas real quick. But Linda Robinson, a lot on the table um, from that man. Yes, absolutely. Appreciate certainly his service, your service, and, and the experience uh, that you've had. I think there are a couple points I would agree with. I think the press does tend to undercover the th projects that are going on there, like the building of clinics and some of the reconstruction work, there's always a tendency to go after the coverage of the violence, the killing, the bombs, and so forth. And that is, um, uh, I think, just you know, a fact. And, and certainly in the visual media, the visual media is going to go for what's the action photo. Um, I think, though, that I really would disagree with the the proposition that you don't want to have the media over there. And I think that you have, in fact, through this embed program, educated a whole generation of uh, U.S. and even international reporters in how the military does its job. And the because there aren't many reporters nowadays who have uh, military experience themselves. So these last um, four years have really been an education. And I think that Perhaps the callers should read more widely in the media. I think there are actually a lot of great stories that come out of this embed program because the uh, individual reporter gets to know individual soldiers and writes about the work that's being done on the ground by the individual soldier. Where I think the major questions are is at the level of policy. W that, that we do not have the right formula yet, and it's been 
three and a half years of searching around for the right formula, and it's not just military. It's a combination of military, economic, and political measures that have to fit together in a very complicated jigsaw puzzle. And what I think, unfortunately at least, the initial perception of this new plan is, is going for the troop solution, when the troop solution is at most one piece of this puzzle. Rhetoric seems to be increasing. Here's Steve Chapman, who is an, a libertarian and is not a liberal, and the headline is Groundhog Day in Iraq. Let me go down to this paragraph, what I meant by rhetoric. Either you have to believe this latest program is truly different, or you have to assume he has learned better ways to implement it. But the basic formula is identical to those of the past for the obvious reason that Mr. Bush has little capacity to learn from his mistakes. Trusting him to devise a successful formula for Iraq is like asking Jeffrey K. Skilling to come back and revive Enron. I think we need to be specific about this because there, and I, I understand the skepticism of the criticisms that some of the callers here have, have voiced. Um, in the case of the operation to secure Baghdad last summer, troops were sent in uh, to clear the areas, but there weren't enough to hold the areas. Um, there was money promised to come in right away with projects, economic reconstruction projects in uh, Baghdad that money did not materialize. Now what uh, we're being told, and, and also the political measures uh, that I mentioned before that the Maliki government promised to deliver which haven't been delivered. Now what you have is a statement by the U.S. President, yes, Maliki's going to deliver on these promises, uh, but no specificity to that, no sense of what happens if they do not deliver the same thing, you're trusting again the Iraqi government to come up with those funds and also to send the troops. Now we will see very quickly on February 1st, the first of the Iraqi troops are supposed to arrive there. Uh, and I want to go a little bit more into the, the actual detail of the troops that are supposed to arrive. There's an increase of 8,000 Iraqi forces that are due into uh, Baghdad. The U.S. is sending initially 7,000 more into Baghdad and then another 10,500 uh, destined to go to Baghdad if needed, but it's going to be kind of a phased approach. So you're actually getting a greater plus up of U.S. forces. This came out in the hearings yesterday. Uh, General Pace was repeatedly asked about the numbers. It took a while to get it all out because often people talk about brigades, battalions, and those, what does that translate into in terms of numbers? And at one point during the questioning, General Pace even admitted that that number of Iraqi troops the total number may not materialize because at any given point some of them are on leave uh, because there's no banking system in Iraq so when they get their pay they have to leave and go home to their families and physically take uh, their pay with them uh, so you you won't get that full total number in there and that's a, the uh, true also on the macro level we have now trained and equipped 328,000 328, uh, Iraqi soldiers and policemen the attrition has been about 10 percent, so you have that many fewer that are actually out there, of which the police are totally unreliable. When people look at what are the real ratios you need there, they say count on the army, the Iraqi army. The police still is just not up to snuff. So these are some of the detailed problems that have to be addressed for this to work. The brigade is how large? If, if it's an Iraqi brigade. Um, it's about 2,500. In the case of a U.S. brigade with all of its attachments, the brigade combat teams, it's about 5,000. So that's why it's very dangerous to just talk in terms of brigades because you've got to know So what we're talking about five American brigades roughly that are supposed to be sent over there. That's right. The total there that we've been told is 21,500 American um, troops, soldiers, and Marines going over, of which 17,500 are destined for Baghdad. 4,000 are destined for Ambar province where the Sunni insurgency has its base. Let's go to Turkey, standing uh, by from International Line. Go ahead, please, Turkey, you're on the air. Yes, uh, good morning to you both. Morning. Mm -hmm. uh, I was wondering if you could comment on this uh, latest incident of uh, several uh, uh, American soldiers landing uh, by helicopter on a building in, I think it's Erbil in northern Iraq, uh, and uh, taking taking hold of four Iranian diplomats, hooding them, putting a bag over their heads, and then dragging them off somewhere. I was wondering if you knew what the outcome of that was, and if you thought that was actually legal, considering that uh, uh, 
Well, the Americans justified uh, this operation saying that the uh, building in question was not actually was not an official official consulate. Thanks. In the uh, papers this morning, they suggest that this was uh, as a result of what the president said about you know cutting off the Iranians or the Syrians coming into Iraq. Are you aware of this story? Yes, but we're still getting details out of it, and I think this dispute about whether or not it was an Iranian consulate, but certainly there are those who claim it was functioning as an Iranian consulate, and the Kurdish officials, because Erbil is part of the uh, Kurdish uh, region there, uh, were not terribly happy about this, did not seem to know in advance that it was happening. But yes, it's part of, and it's not the first one, there was also another raid, if you will, into offices of the Iranian party, Skiri, where some Iranian um, Iranians were found and what they're trying to do when they have targeted those Iranians they believe are directly involved in bringing in the bombing, the IED material and directly involved in supporting these terror networks um, they're saying as part of the military operations we have a right and indeed an obligation to go in and round up these people um, but I think it's causing something of a diplomatic flap uh, both within Iraq and also we'll see what the Iranian reaction is um, but they are certainly saying that we need to do this to uh, cut the foreign interference uh, that is aiding uh, the insurgency and the Shia militia's violence over there. The House comes in at the top of the hour, and they will have one-minute speeches and go to the debate on the drug bill. The Senate comes in today and debates ethics as they continue dealing with <clears throat> a lot of the issues that the House uh, has already passed. And on C-SPAN 3, you can watch Carl Levin's Committee on Armed Services have before them Robert Gates, the new Secretary of Defense, and Peter Pace, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Let's go to Hugo, Oklahoma. You're on the air. Um, yes. I would like to say that in the first place, the Democrats and the Republicans voted to go to war in Iraq. And the mistake was not sending enough troops in the first place. And I would also like to see someone do an unbiased <coughs> uh, survey of the people in Iraq to see if they want us over there or not, because I, I hear I hear all sides. I, I watch CNN and I watch Fox News and I watch C-SPAN. I mean, I just when I'm at home, that's all I watch is different news channels. Thanks. There is a mm -hmm. survey that Zogby did, I think, that shows that 80 percent of the people over in Iraq don't want us there. That's right. But there are also some surveys that say, yes, they want us to leave, but not right now, or this understanding that if America would just pick up and leave tomorrow. Um, chances are the place would be engulfed in even worse violence um, because right now the Iraqi uh, security forces are just not ready for prime time and in terms of the uh, caller's other point which is were there not enough forces there to begin with this is part of the ongoing debate and as I said with the um, General Shinseki and the, the standard ratio used 500,000 uh, uh, troops military and police is a rough ballpark and while you may have it on paper there in terms of the Iraqi numbers we've trained 328,000 but they're not all on duty they're not all trustworthy they're not all competent um, and 140,000 US and coalition troops so you may have numbers on paper but when you break it down you don't have uh, the force that you need doing the jobs. The other point, though, is the 140,000 U.S. troops are not all out in the streets. You have a heavy logistics tail on this force. Many people sitting on bases, uh, many people guarding supply lines, guarding bases, um, and doing logistics tasks. So and the 21,500 new troops that will be sent over there, how many of them will actually be in the, uh, will be combat in the street? They're intending to put these people largely on the street and in quick reaction forces. So this is supposed to be devoted to plussing up what's already there in Baghdad right now. There's 42,000 Iraqi and 24,000 uh, Americans right now. So they're going to be plussing up that um, by about 17,000 U.S. and about 8,000 Iraqi. Fulton, New York, you're on the air with Leonard Robinson. Yeah, hello. Um, this plan is idiotic that Bush has proposed, and of course, it, like every plan he has, um, everything he's done, I, I believe that the only reason he's doing this is to try and uh, basically buy time so he can pass this war. It's already a lost war. It's not even a losing war. We've lost this war. He's trying to pass it on to the next president, and just like everything else in his life, he's never taken responsibility for anything. The other thing I see in, in kind of Lisa Rice's talks, and uh, she's been sent out to do this more than Bush has, even in his speech, they're calling it an Iraqi plan, which is ridiculous. 
they're claiming that if it fails, it's because the Iraqis didn't step up to the plate. Uh, to me, to, to blame the Iraq people for losing this war is like uh, pointing a gun at someone or a group of people and telling them they have to play in your football team, and then just as you're about to be sacked, you pass the ball off to them and they don't want to take it, and you blame them for not taking the pass. I mean, they didn't ask to be invaded, so how can we blame them for losing a war they never initiated? Um, Caller, can I ask you a question about uh, people that believe what you do about this war? If uh, the people in Congress and in the House and Senate believe like you do, why don't they do more than they're doing to stop all this? That might come, um, and I think what Bush is going to push it to the limit, what he's also doing, I think, is, is setting up trying to bait Iran so that he can do some bombing raids and uh, try to knock out their nuclear facilities, and that's going to really, you know, at a certain point, people will have enough. Uh, the Democrats have been gutless. They were gutless in the vote. And I'm a Democrat, but the leaders were gutless in their vote against, uh, or vote giving Bush the, Bush the authorization to, to declare war. I think they're worried too much about the political backlash if they cut the funding, and uh, they worry too much. They think a little too much about those things rather than go with what's right. Um, you know, I, I went to um, um, town meetings before this war even started. I spoke up to, to Chuck Schumer in this state, New York State. I told him this was an idiotic idea. A lot of people on uh, peace groups like my, myself did the same thing. We're just average citizens. We tried to do what we could, um, emailing people and so forth. And those of us that have been proven right are totally ignored now. It just uh, by the people like the one that called earlier claiming that, oh, we, we, we don't allow the you know the military to do what it should do. Who's stopping it? The the, the, the people in power are the Republicans. Uh, you know they'll they'll blame the media. They'll blame that it was a politically correct war and we didn't use enough force. Uh, they're going to say all the same things that were said about Vietnam. This is Vietnam too. The difference is primarily being there are fewer casualties, American casualties, uh, but the consequences of losing are much more severe. Whenever they say the consequences of losing are severe, that doesn't mean we have to win. We can't win. Winning is no longer an option. Thanks, Carr. Fulton, New York. What do you say? Um, I think there's uh, there's some really good points a caller has made, and and one thing that Secretary Defense Secretary Gates did say yesterday in the hearing several times in a few months we'll be able to see if the Iraqis are able to get a political solution. So um, there is a, an agreement on these key political issues: the oil, the political representation, debathification, uh, and m militia demobilization. The thing about it, as the caller pointed out, it, just leaving it up to the Iraqis, because they haven't been able to do it so far, what U.S. help can be forthcoming? There was no mention of this in the speech, no envoy, no diplomatic initiative, no other way to help them reach agreement. Uh, so it seems like the U.S. is kind of in the posture of waiting to see what the Iraqis are going to do. What was offered was... Uh, Secretary Rice said there is a reconstruction coordinator that's just been appointed to try to pull together the U.S. economic reconstruction efforts over there, which is something that should have been done day one. The other thing she said was they're going to double the number of provincial reconstruction teams up to 18. That blueprint for 18 has been there for at least a year. So, again, we're talking about things that they've been promising that haven't happened. Let me ask you quickly, uh, if the American people could see all of the, quote, good things that have been done over in Iraq, providing that there are a lot of good things, and they were all published, uh, they're put on this network, or put every, would that change the opinion of people in the audience? And do you think there are that many good things that have been done that are worthy of coverage? There are good things that have been done, and I think it's it's fair to say the press hasn't covered enough of them. Sometimes it's you're not there in the place. Sometimes, though, it's a choice to cover the more bloody uh, drama than this slow, hard work in the trenches. Um, but the problem also is good works sometimes have been ephemeral. There were some neighborhoods of Baghdad that were cleared last summer. Uh, there was the town of Ta uh, Talafer up in the northwest that was cleared. There was progress in Mosul, then it slid back into chaos. You see, the problem has been people have been working and sacrificing and dying to try to push things forward. But you, at some point, you have to draw the bottom line and say, have we got lasting progress? Is the formula working? What's the key that's going to unlock the door? And I think this is really where people have come. And you see this sense of exhaustion and disappointment in the Congress saying, clearly, the formula hasn't come together. And, and President Bush himself said, this is unacceptable. So we are at the point now, I think, of the reckoning in this country. U.S. News' is Linda Robinson. We go to Cocoa, Florida. You're on the air.
Yes. Good morning. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes. Go ahead, please. Um, first, first, I think they should have a, a ink boat again on whether we should stay in there or not instead of uh, poles. Uh, next, I, I'd like to know where the UN is. Uh, I believe that uh, the Congress, uh, we're working under a Congress resolution and a UN uh, resolution when we're pulling troops out of these 14 providences that are pacified, why aren't we putting blue blue uh, helmets in there or maybe even NATO to help it from flaring back up? Thanks, caller. Uh, first of all, are the 14 provinces out of the 18 pacified? Are they quiet? Are, are the good works being done in those provinces? Um, there is greater calm in the 14 of the 18. However, and this is what uh, when I why I went to the north in my last visit, Mosul and Kirkuk are still very problematic cities. Um, and this is why these ideas like partition really aren't that viable, because you have a mixture of all the ethnic groups in those um, cities. And Kirkuk, especially, this is where the Kurds have a wish to take over, take back that city. Uh, so you've got a real flashpoint there. Basra, the British are trying to root out uh, some of the militia and sectarian influences that it have infiltrated uh, the Basra leaving. forces. They're on a path to turn over, but they're recognizing, they're working very hard right now to uh, root out the uh, militia groups and the, the, the people who have infiltrated the police forces in Basra. So you have relative calm in those areas, but not total calm. Um, and this is one of the other points why this plan is focused on stabilizing Baghdad and putting some numbers out in Anbar province um, you don't, that is a partial solution. You have to say, what then? Because you still need, and I think the, um, the, the serious folks here realize this is going to take a while. You're going to have to move some of these forces around, assuming you can get ba Baghdad stabilized, but there still could be a deficit of as much as 30,000 troops a in the Baghdad plan. House will be in in about 10 minutes. Westwood, New Jersey, good morning. Good morning to both of you. Three brief points. Uh, first, Bush frightens me, but uh, the Army Surgeon General reports 30 to 40 percent of returning Iraq vets suffer some form of mental illness. Number two, uh, the British Medical Journal Lancet reports over 600,000 innocent men, women, and children killed through shock and awe, etc. And lastly, the majority of Americans, and I hope my friend from Turkey is listening, along with many Republicans like Norm Coleman and the entire British people, as well as their new government, are against Bush's arrogant, immoral, bloody nightmare. And by the way, um, don't believe Bush being a Christian because Jesus did say, bless are the peacemakers, not the warmongers. Thanks. What about the, he references that 600,000 figure from Lancet. Is, uh, mm -hmm. Do you have any information on whether that's accurate or not? I don't, unfortunately. But I, I do think there it is important to note because we often um, do quote the figure of three, now it's 3,000, over 3,000 uh, U.S. killed in the war. Uh, many, many wounded, tens of thousands of wounded, some very seriously, and because of the IED problem, you've got amputees, multiple amputees, and these people definitely are, while they are making tremendous recoveries, they need uh, support. And there is the non-physical uh, legacy of the post-traumatic stress syndrome and that uh, kind of injury as well. So I think it's a very important point the caller makes. Tehran, Iran, you're on the air. Uh, hi. Uh, I'm calling from Tehran. Uh, I've uh, lived in America before, and I went to school there, and I know Americans are good-hearted people, and uh, they're kind and uh, willing to help um, any way they can. Uh, I would like to say that Iranians are the same. You know, they, they have the same feelings uh, as Americans do towards others, uh, but I think there is, no, uh, there is no military solution to Iraq. Uh, there is only a political solution to Iraq. And uh, I would like to uh, say that uh, since Iran uh, has a lot of influence in the region, uh, why doesn't uh, President Bush or the American government uh, try to uh, cooperate with the Iranian government in solving the problem of the region? 
Thanks. What are mm -hmm. the chances that President mm -hmm. Bush will talk to Ahmadinejad? Um, that's a, a very good point, and the caller, I'm glad he brought it up because we haven't talked about that. It was a subject of much discussion in the congressional hearings yesterday. Secretary Rice was asked repeatedly, why doesn't President Bush go and get on a plane and go to Iran? And I think that many up there agree a political solution is the key. I mean, I think Iraqis themselves have to be the ones um, to do it. But if the region can help, if the U.S. can help, you know, that is uh, important. But her answer, Secretary Rice's answer, was in effect, if the Iranians believed, if the Iranian government believed it was in their interest uh, to stabilize Iraq, they would already be doing it. And if we got into negotiations with them, they would ask us for a price that would be like extortion, that we would have to pay in order to gain their agreement. So that was really kind of a, and she said, we've been offering, as you know, in the context of the Iranian nuclear program, we've been offering talks if they would just uh, comply with the request to halt the enrichment. Um, and and uh, she also indica indicated that uh, the price that Iran might ask in exchange for its help on Iraq would be to drop the UN Security Council proceedings that are moving slowly towards the sanctions um, for Iran's nuclear program. So that's a quid pro quo that uh, the administration is clearly unwilling to give. So in essence, she's saying, why go into diplomacy when we're not prepared to pay the price that the Iranians and the Syrians would ask uh, for their help. If it's in their interest, they'll give it. Um, but I think that, that the retort to that that many even Republican senators had was, you, you don't, it's not a gift. Diplomacy isn't a gift. Just go over there the way Nixon went to China and engage and see what could be worked out. You, you know, you have to use that tool in the toolkit. So that's where we are. Linda Robinson, we go to Marshfield, Wisconsin. Good morning. Uh, good morning. Thanks for taking my call. Uh, I just want to comment on the president's speech. Um, one of the things he said is that we would be monitoring, monitoring the borders between Syria, Iraq, and Iran, and uh, we can't even monitor our own borders. Uh, another thing he said is that we have to increase our diplomatic contacts, and Senator Durbin said we needed a surge in diplomacy. And I think that should have been our first uh, option all along, because as intelligent beings, uh, we should always be able to negotiate. The fourth thing he said was that he wanted to, or the third thing, was that he wanted to create a democracy in a new country that upholds the rule of law. I hope he is not using this administration as the example of a country and uh, rules of law, secret rendition, secret prisons, uh, suspending rights for the prisoners. And then lastly, that he wanted to create another working group to study the problems in Iraq. Thank you very much for taking my call. Two more calls after this, and we'll go to the House. But, Linda mm -hmm. Robinson, your reaction? Um, just, I think that's absolutely right. I spend a lot of time covering Latin America and the Mexican border, U.S.-Mexico border, very porous, as we all know. Uh, that's a good point. There is one thing that we have failed to mention, and that is that there is an effort to reinvigorate the Israeli-Palestinian peace process, and Secretary Rice is on her way over. So that is the one, I think, development on the... Um, diplomatic front that we should note is underway, even if there is not much hope being held out for an Iranian overture. Waynesboro, North Carolina, good morning. Good morning, how are you? Fine, sir. Great. Um, the thing that, that bothers me is that half of the callers called in talking about the president. I myself think that he's made a, a few bad choices, but we are at war. This is not a basketball game where we can have the option to just pull out. This is something that we have to take care of. If we just leave it like it is, we will be defeating ourselves. Every TV show, Iraqis, Iran, all these countries view us on TV, bad-mouthing our president. He is the president. He is the chief. He is the leader. And either we stand behind them or we don't. I don't understand how you, you bad-mouth the man who is, who is trying to make things in this world better. Yeah, he's made bad choices and, and some mistakes, but you just can't pull out of a situation that we are knee-deep in. Linda Robinson. Mm -hmm. Well, the president certainly has the lead on foreign policy, but Congress does also have a role, uh, certainly in the funding and explicit role, um, but there is this tradition of advice and consent, and I think that that is where um, I just... Um, 
we'll mention one congressman uh, Sununu from Senator. Senator, Senator Sununu from New Hampshire yesterday said look if you folks don't have a timeline to impose on the Iraqis maybe Congress should I mean I think that where you're getting to uh, is a sense that Congress may become more active uh, in trying to beef up this plan if it does not appear to be working. So, uh, and I think the administration has partially opened the door to that with its bipartisan working group. But I think we'll see in the coming days the reaction to the plan. The administration officials and the president himself are out this weekend. You know, they're going to try to sell the plan. Uh, but hopefully they'll also be listening and will respond to some of the constructive uh, suggestions that people are making about how to try to ensure that this uh, revision of the approach works. And I think that is, I get very much a sense that people in Congress know the stakes. They know that pulling out abruptly is not the answer, that you would invite chaos. But it is very late in the day, and I think there's a real sense of urgency that this, this next approach needs to be the right one. President will be on 60 Minutes on Sunday night and the Vice President on Fox News Sunday, Sunday morning. Geneva, New York, last call. Go ahead, please. Uh, yes, this is uh, related to uh, the veterans and the soldiers in the field. I myself <coughs> am a Vietnam-era veteran. Can you comment on the report, and it's only been carried, as far as I can see, by Keith Olbermann and Chris Matthews about a defense system against rocket, rocket propelled grenades that works that has been tested in Israel and which our procurement office in the army are totally stonewalling, refusing to be interviewed, and no senator or representative from either side of the aisle is protesting this. Thank you. That's my question. Yes. Um, I appreciate the caller's question, and I actually saw the report last night uh, that Lisa Myers did on MSNBC about this. I have not personally investigated it, but it, the essence of the story is that there is this uh, system, I think it's called the trophy system that Israel's developed, and the U.S. is instead pursuing another system that is, according to that news report, either less capable or l lagging in development. Uh, and the allegation is that uh, since this is part of the future combat system, this giant modernization program that the Army has, uh, that they're favoring going ahead with that package rather than something that perhaps is readier now. I personally can't vouch for the truth of this story, but that is what it's about. And I think, um, again, we, there are uh, lots of initiatives underway, billions of dollars uh, being spent trying to improve the equipment and the tactics over there. But this is one question I can't afraid. I Our can't. guest has been Linda Robinson, senior writer for U.S. News and World Report, a native of Pittsburgh, a graduate of Swarthmore College, a 17-year veteran of U.S. News, and a senior writer on national security and military. Thank you for joining us, and now to the floor of the House.